and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Previously, the man behind Heaven and Hell, Ascent Ascension, and the man who, some who I'm some who somehow was willing to go along with some of my crazy fighting game ideas. The one and only Joel Rugden Hill. Hello, it is me. Now, now coming to us with Dawn, and congratulations on get on getting that to at the time of this recording. Um, just 15 shy of 1,800 Canadian when you were asking yeah. for 500 initially. It's a, it's really cool. I'm really glad that uh, that is happening. So the first time that I had the first time that I had you on, I think we okay. touched on Dawn briefly, but that was that was us touching on heaven and heaven or hell and some of the other stuff just to, just as a um, grab bag. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to when it comes to Dawn, um, how did the idea come? How did the idea come about? Because from what I recall, this is the successor to a previous version called Advent Dawn, which I, in my archives, listed as zeroth edition. Yeah, um, I used to. It used to be my first game on my itch, Advent Dawn, but now I, I've taken it down for. A lot of reasons. Um, mostly, of course, that I'm losing Dawn now, and that's sort of like the good version, I guess you could say. Um, but originally, Advent Dawn was like a branch off of uh, a bunch of D and D five E homebrew I did, and less so the mechanics, but more so the world building. Uh, I did a lot of like world building with friends who I was playing five E games with, and eventually. I was doing enough homebrew where I was like, I think I want to take a crack at making my own system. And Avant Dawn is this very, like, esoteric, diceless game with, like, weird... You had to, like, bid resources at each other, and it was sort of like a chickening out resolution system where if you were willing to bid more than the GM, you won the, you won the check. Um... But lots of weird mechanics. There, you could. There was like weapon crafting, and there was like dozens and pa of pages for like the details of it. It's like more complex than your actual character. It was. It was very messy, but lots of lots of passion in it. Yeah, a ca a case of more passion than than common sense. Exactly. Yes. Oh. What's What's kind of amusing is that you you said that this start. Now, first off, oh. Um, a a game that started as a bunch of house rules and then became its own thing, as I've mentioned in the past, um, you're in good company when it comes to that. Yeah. But one of the one of the first things that I no that I noticed is going fr going from five e house ruling to a d six based resolution system with exploding d six. Yes. Um. That one actually. So, Dawn, if it wasn't always from a lot of the marketing, it's very inspired by like shonen anime and manga. Uh, I'm super into them, always have been. Mm -hmm. um, and that I idea actually came from when some of my friends wanted me to run a Dragon Ball game, and I was looking for a bunch of like simple systems that they wouldn't like be too intimidated to learn. Uh, and I came across a like a uh, Power of the Apocalypse adjacent Dragon Ball system that used D6 pools and exploding D6, and I thought it was like really good for sort of getting that feeling of those big like uh, clashes and the these super like I like sort of inflated moments of of, of tension and, and drama that come with a lot of the like Dragon Ball y uh, like inspirations that people wanted to pull from. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I don't think I've used a D twenty since I've started making games, which is funny. Um, because my first game was a super weird system that was totally diceless. Uh, because I was frustrated with some of the like D and D isms that 
were coming from my other game, the, my other like campaigns I was doing with 5e. Uh, and since then, I've mostly been using D6. Well, D6s are going to be easy to find because everybody's got one in one form or another. If you don't, and if you don't have one, you can get one for dirt cheap in any convenience store. Yeah. And, um, just about anywhere. I'd say the the only uh, the only other kind of gaming apparatus that ev that everybody has in some form is a deck of playing cards. Mm -hmm. like, I think uh, that's like really the main reason why, right? It's because like when I was writing uh, before, I didn't really have any money. I still don't really have any money. Um, so like the closest thing I had to like tools for running games was like my dad's chessboard and like a Yahtzee set. And like if everybody's if, I guarantee you some if somebody's got any of the board games that even even the most basic of people know, then they have mm -hmm. access to D sixes. Um, yeah. Well if they've if they've got if they're one of the weirdos that have backgammon, they've got access. Yeah. Uh, which, which makes it which makes for an easy easy one to go with, especially since, um, I've as I've mentioned as I've mentioned to you before, I've been doing a hell of a lot of study with, um, Japanese tabletop. Most of the ones that I've been able mm -hmm. to find use some variation of a D6 system. The reason why I was surprised when Convictor Drive did um did it did a did a D10 system is because it's so ingrained to do D to do D6 um especially 2D6 within a lot of Japanese tabletop that somebody doing D10s is um far more of the exception yeah, I have. I have. I've also done some reading to that, and yeah, they use so much D six. Yeah. Um. And of course, of course, the other thing is is the exploding die, which more games need to use exploding die. I I honestly think exploding die is more fun than um the typical critical. Mm hmm. Largely, be largely because of the fact that with a critical, it's an automatic success. It's supposed to be a really good success, but there's no, there's not, there's not as much of a tangible effect of that as opposed to um, exploding die, where you can just keep rolling. Yeah, I, I also think a lot of my game inspiration comes from video games. Obviously, I also think that um, normal like crit systems or the normal crit system. I, I've seen Lancer do this, but the like video gamey idea of like increasing your like crit rates and the effects on crit, I feel like are super underutilized in a lot of tabletop games, and it's a, it's a really fun and like um, evocative mechanic to use. Uh, and I think there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with representing explosive hits as uh, crits in a video gamey sense. It's, it's really interesting to me. Plus, there's also the bell curve thing. Mm -hmm. um... Like I, I know, I know some riffs, uh, not riffs apologists. Um, GURP stands will constantly talk about the bell curve when it comes to it using three D six as, it, as its basis, mm -hmm. um, which is going is going to have a more interest is going to have a more interesting spread than say five percent for everything, which is what a D twenty is. Yeah. Um, though I. I I'm not I'm not gonna say that I've tried to I've tried to narrow down the um, probabilities depending on how many d d six because that's a in the that's an in the weeds thing. Oh yeah. But you had you had said that um, Dawn is heavily inspired by a lot of sh a lot of um, shown I guess shown in battle manga would be the would be the proper term since you brought up the yeah. Movie. But outside of DBZ, what would some of the other series that that would fit within the appendix N, especially with the um, setting that you're trying to trying to set up with the worlds of dawn? Yeah, um, I think I'm glad you brought up the the settings with the worlds because I think they're sort of my main avenue right now of expressing 
That, uh, I really like, um, what's the word? Setting agnostic games where you can, like, sort of build in whatever you want. Because I feel like it's always the way I, I ran games. Um, but I do think there is the the issue of... I know this is a bit off topic, but I'm, I'm going to be circling back to the point. Uh, this is the issue for a lot of people of the games feeling sort of bland and boring. And I really want the to, especially as I commission art, to integrate those worlds more into it and be able to like express that sort of fun like artistic side of, of reading through the game through that and ironically Dragon Ball isn't really an inspiration for any of them. I mentioned Dragon Ball before because I did actually you know run a Dragon Ball game but that was more so because a lot of my friends were super into it but out of all of the like big famous shonen battle manga I I didn't really like Dragon Ball that much, or at least like the later parts of it. I, I I've read I, I've read it and I, I do like it for the most part, but it's definitely not in like my top ten. Um, um I mm -hmm. for what it's worth have have had the attitude of preferring the original Dragon Ball to um, Z. Yeah, I really like. I think the the original Dragon Ball is a nice little like. A nice little story all wrapped up in a bow, but uh, as it goes on, there's a lot of things that are lost that I'm 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 sad about. But yeah, a lot of more recent stuff is a big inspiration. Uh, I'm a big fan of. I don't think there's actually a manga for this. I, I mostly read, but one of the few anime that are an inspiration for it is Blood Blockade Battlefront, which is if you've seen it, this like urban fantasy uh, style. One with God, it's really weird to explain. Uh... <laughs> it's it's one it's it's Naito's um baby, so it being yeah. it being weird is not too much of a surprise for me. It's really weird and really stylish, and I I, I love. Um, I've actually used a lot of their music for uh, battle tracks in my my sessions, and the same for Star and City actually, which is a urban fantasy and... game. For for what it's worth, um, yeah. If you're not familiar with Yasuhiro Naito, he's the same guy behind Trigun and Gungrave. Mm hmm. I I ended up watching Trigun too uh, after I started, but the Lesos Vince inspiration actually no. One of the worlds is big Trigun inspired. The one of Santa Stars is very much uh, Trigun and uh, Magi. Ma the Famous Labyrinth of Magic? Right? Yeah, the Labyrinth of Magic uh, is, I think, really the main inspiration for Santa Stars. That sort of, like, um, super exaggerated and, like, colorful uh, 1001 Nights type of aesthetic I really, really like. I, I'm using names from the original uh, 1001 Nights for the current uh, campaign or running set in that world. Uh, and the second world currently that I, I just wrote up for the most recent version is uh, un unsurprisingly coming from me, inspired by a lot of fighting games actually, uh, Melty Blood and um, Undernight specifically. The French bread games are these like either based on visual novels or visual novel inspired uh, games that are super all about like these very normal seeming people who uh have some sort of supernatural abilities or uh like are, are hunted monsters in, in the in the dead of night well while the rest of the waking world you know lives peacefully mm. as well as um fate for the type of like power set that i wrote up for it mm -hmm. other than that uh a lot of Bleach. I've been I I I've read Bleach again recently, and I I read it uh when I was writing it originally, um and a lot of the the way they pace things and the way that like a lot of the tropes that are used I I, I try to represent and I really enjoy and I I try to like show in in how I write different abilities and stuff. Mm -hmm. And but. Yeah, I can. Yeah, right now I think those are the main ones that are most clearly like visually represented um, in the book. Other than that, there's of course. 
And the obvious ones. I watched a lot of Naruto. I loved what Fairy I, Tale when I was when I was a kid. I, what I more can, of a kid. I'm 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 still pretty young for yeah. uh, a writer, but yeah. One thing I can't help. One thing that I can't help but notice and hang on. Probably name a few more, but if I can't think of them now. They're probably not super major inspirations. Sorry, sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me, but um, one of the things I couldn't help but notice is mm -hmm. even with the setting agnosticism. Um, there's still a, there's still a bit of guidance, and I'm guessing that was your way to reduce the the potential of a setting agnostic game making um, making char making characters and stories that are a that are average. Yeah, it's, it's meant to not so that the set so that the setting thing isn't throwing people right into the middle of it. Yeah, exactly. Um... I didn't care for the details too much, hence why I said agnostic, but there are definitely a lot of, like, vibes and themes that I, I want to make sure that the readers know about, even if they're not, like... I don't want to have to rely on people, like, being in the same brain space as me and, like, getting it and, like, just knowing the same inspirations. I, I wanted to write up a little thing of, like, here's the here's the idea, here is, is what I personally think that these stories are like trying to like say and do and how they're they're choosing to express themselves and th these are things that you could choose to embody even outside of the medium mm -hmm. I, I think it did pretty well but there's still a bit more yeah. i want to add uh, now when it comes to the when it comes to the Rome, because of because of that whole adage, all roads lead to Rome. As as I understand it, mm -hmm. it is it is largely um, rolling rolling based on is it attribute and skill and fours and above or hits. Yes. But the, but even with that, you have you have it where um, there isn't a set skill list, but one that um, players ma players make. Um, mm -hmm. Now I I know in I know there were there was a bit of advice by the by the tech by the text that's in the current version that that is available um zero point nine point eight yes I am curious if in the full book you do plan on having a sa a sample list so that people can kind of get a feel for where the line is. I was thinking about that recently, and I'm thinking I'm going to go down one of two routes. Either A, no matter what road I'm going down, I go down, there will be some examples. A, there is a general list of, like, um, like how Lancer does it. Lancer has a similar system where there are uh, a, a good number of sort of standard skills, but within rules as written, you're able to write whatever you want, and the standard skills are just meant to serve as example. In a lot of games, people just use the standard skills, and that's, like, totally fine, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they exist. Yeah. But there's always the, the option to write your own, and I want to either, A, just make a standard list like that that I think would fit into any setting, keep it kind of vague, or B, I'd like to write up a specific list for the worlds. Uh, right now there are only two, but I'd like to get four, maybe even six, if maybe I can get some guest writers and they can write their own, I think that'd be fun. If if I can offer my own suggestion, yeah. write write them based on theme. Okay. Uh, if if you're gonna if you're gonna be going setting agnostic, then say a list of suggested skills for fantasy settings, a list of suggested skills for for more science fiction settings, one for urban fantasy. Yeah. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. I definitely think. Um... There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all, uh, but I, I want to make sure I don't get too specific as to make them useless if you're not using one of those preset things. So yeah. I'll have to do some, some adjustments. The The way I set up the worlds makes it a bit more hard on myself, but there's definitely there's plenty of ways I could do it. Yeah, the... the sk skills, as they, as they are now, could be considered a um, blank check of sorts. Mm -hmm. Um... I, did I talk to you at, at any point about what I call blank check design? And Discord decided to derp on me. Sorry about that, folks. We'll be back in one second. Hopefully.
There we go. Loading back up. Sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me. Yeah. Oh. I kept, I was I was about to ask if I had explained to you what I meant by blank check design. Uh I'm not sure you have, no. Oh, it's basic it's basically any sort of descriptive thing de descriptive mechanic where um it's written in that you can put just about anything in it. Yeah. The pro the problem that, the problem is is th is that when you do when you do that it's important to establish where the line is and what would be pushing your luck in terms yeah. of it. Otherwise, it's going to get abused, um, or or you're going to have people play it safe. One of the big examples I use when it comes to blank check design is the aspect system in Fate. Yes, because it Fate doesn't really do a good job of defining what a um, what a good or a bad aspect is. Mm-hmm. I may have been spoiled by 13th Age having a two-page spread going into exactly this. Yeah. Because it has a blank check in the form of the one unique thing, but it has this aside ch um, chapter that goes into which um, one unique things would be a good idea and why, a questionable mm -hmm. idea and why, and a absolutely not and why. Yeah. Oh. Because it's it's something that it's something that can be seen, especially since um you've probably seen as much as I have how some games are a little bit excessive when it comes to um skills. Like mm -hmm. I remember, I remember in I remember um, yelling at how th how third edition needed to have a skill for run, jump, climb, and you and use rope and swim. Uh -huh. like, do all of those need to be separate skills? Or Shadowrun d deciding that every single um, melee and ranged weapon is its own skill? Oh yeah, same way with um, Cyberpunk twenty twenty. Yeah. I think red has dialed that back a little bit, but it is still a, it is still a concern. Um, yeah, it's a little bit less of a concern when you're dealing with a game that is skill based. It's more of an artifact of the of the '90s when everybody was trying to go for this uber detail simulationism. Yeah. Oh, I don't have anything against simulationism, but it's a pendulum. You can swing one too, you can swing too far one way or the other. Mm -hmm. People definitely enjoy it. I can just I cannot d design simulationism. It's just like against my very being. I'm not too big of a fan playing it, but it's very much like a, a me thing. Mm -hmm. And you should you shouldn't be you shouldn't be asked to do that because mm -hmm. there are other there are other people who are going to do that. Nobody's going to be doing every setup all the time. True. True. Um. Uh, now, with the with that in with that in mind, um. The other, I think one of the other th one of the other things to no to note is how is how you handled the fact that you kind of and kind and kind of don't have um classes. Yes. So. You had you in heaven or hell. You had an you had an archetype system. Is this a extension of that? Uh this the the, the system currently used for Dawn is heavily, heavily, heavily inspired by uh, Tenor Bancho Zero. Actually, uh, it is effectively categorizing every ability into these like sort of groups based on intention but making it so that you are not tied to any uh, of these groups when you're building your character you in mean? both games it's like uh the classes exist to show you like this is this is a solid theme that is envisioned by the designer that this is 
how like the most normal this kind of character is supposed to run but uh whenever you're picking your abilities you are free to pick any number from any different number of classes there is no actual restriction So, with that with that in with that in mind, mm -hmm. um, I'd can I'd kind of like to to go in, to go into the um, the the collection of of um, of the uh, of these powers that you have and kind of get a feel for what their equivalent would be or or what sort of character would lean towards them. Yeah. And first one I'd want to start off with is the powerhouse. Yes. The powerhouse is, I guess, the best way to put it is it is the bruiser uh, class out of everything. Mm -hmm. It is one of, uh, I guess, three DPS classes. This one focused on... I, I think you'll see as we go along, all of the DPS classes are split into the range they want to be in most often, uh, and how they pace their damage throughout the fight. Mm -hmm. The powerhouse powers all pretty much all want you to be adjacent to enemies, or very close to adjacent, and sort of equally dole out their damage every turn. They don't need a setup for a lot of things, they don't have a lot of fall-offs or like big mistakes you can make when setting up your turns. They're very simple, they get in, they punch you, and they try to survive the damage they take uh, through a lot of abilities that sustain and let them do damage, or give them more damage when they are taking hits. Mm -hmm. The Slayer. Slayer is, uh, in terms of ramage and pa oh, ramage, uh, range and pacing, again, uh, Slayer is a bit further back needing to be out of the mix for their setup, and then do big bursts after short setup turns. They have the classic, like, uh, assassin characters, and um, I guess, yeah, that's just the best way to put it. They have a lot of assassin characters. They set up on specific targets, deal huge single-target damage, and are able to uh, either stay out of stay out of the direct line of fire or get in and out very quickly. So glass cannon. Yeah, super glass cannony. Mm -hmm. Um, bulwark. Bulwark is to one of the two, or I guess three if you want to stretch the definite definition. Supportive roles, um, with it being the one that keeps everyone alive, I guess. Bulwarks are super defensive, and pretty much every power there uh, is only preventing damage from someone. They're not all uh, like supportive and defending allies. Some of them are just making yourself more bulky, very often because those support abilities make it so you have to take some damage or put yourself in danger to do them. But it's always just about... Uh, getting into the mix a lot like the powerhouse in terms of how you do your movement, making them very compatible if you want to mix their powers. Mm -hmm. um, but rather than attempting to deal damage, you want to probably gain resources and set up for the enemy turn, where you are going to be attacked or uh, preventing attacks from enemies. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in that regard, the bulwark would be the closest thing to the typical tank. Yeah, traditional, like, MMO tank, purely um, taunting, absorbing damage. Mm -hmm. um, Altruist. Altruist is the more direct support. All of the abilities make your allies more capable in some way. Uh, sometimes with healing, but very often with more ways for your allies to deal damage. Uh, a lot of the game is you know balanced around dealing this damage, uh, and... Altruist is not going to be, you know, lacking in it just because they are supportive. But all their all their abilities require that they are uh, probably near an ally or you know have living allies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they go off of that pretty much. All right. Um, 
the Disruptor. Disruptor, I said there was kind of three uh, support classes before, because the Disruptor is a... Well, it is a Disruptor. It, it is the control class that allows the player to impede enemies in some way, and sometimes slightly help their allies, but mostly in the sense that uh, if the enemy can't attack, it's almost like I protected my allies from damage. Uh, so this sort of indirect support, not huge damage, based around uh, manipulating the field a lot of the time, or manipulating the positioning of enemies to get rewarded. Um, Ruiner. And Ruiner is the final DPS. It is uh, the opposite of the Slayer in terms of pacing. It also wants to be far away from enemies and not get hit, but because they are um, going to do one really big thing and then fall off after. Very resource intensive, Very requires a lot of setup for a singular action, and a lot of the like best multi-targeting and like sweeping big moves come from Ruiners being able to set them up and execute. Mm -hmm. And since that's the last of them, I... I want to, I want to pick your brain about so, about something, and that it, and that is <clears throat> a bit of word association with the yes. with the um cl with the archetypes for all for all intents and purposes. Since unless mm -hmm. I'm mistaken, you don't have to stick to one stick to one of them. You can pick and choose from the power sets how you like. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is which is why. And I think I think you admitted this er earlier on. Um, referring to them as classes is technically correct, but not ex but not entirely so. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um. So I'm gonna go through them. I'm gonna go through the list again, and I want you to give me the first character that comes to mind. Um, from any from any medium, it can be it can be anime, it can be video games, it can be manga, it can be live action stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, it's Essentially, essentially the nerdiest version of a Rorschach test. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we'll start with the powerhouse. Um, I think the main one that comes to mind, and the, these uh, namings are really going to expose uh, a lot of where the combat is influenced from, but. Either the Berserker classes in DNF, uh, Dungeon Fighter Online, uh, or the basic character uh, Elsword or Raven in Elsword uh, MMOs. I've wanted to do something with both with both of with both of those um, entries that doesn't involve me spending way too much way too many hours in the thing, so. I spent a lot of time on uh, Korean MMO beat em up games <laughs> before, and it definitely shows with the original Evan Dawn and also this Dawn. Um, Slayer. Slayer is very much the. I forget their names now, but the Archer Girl in L Sword. I, I might do some research later. As well as, Rana. like, um. Reyna, yes. As well as, like, Kai from Guilty Gear, or any other, like, duelist characters. Uh, I think that is, like, some of the main archetypes that people will find and, and like to play through that one. Mm -hmm. Bulwark. Bulwark is... This one was. This one is a weird pick, but the first thing I thought of is Dubu from Omega Strikers. It's like, um, like anime inspired, like sports game, like mm -hmm. air hockey with with MOBA characters. It's just like this big, bulky defensive character. Um, yeah, most of those those uh, those Korean MMOs don't have like traditional tank characters because they're all about doing damage yourself, but. Yeah, I guess the first one I thought of was Dubu. Mm -hmm. Altruist. Altruist is classic healer. 
I'm thinking of the the healer girl in Final Fantasy XIV, <laughs> spiritualist girl. Um, Ishtola. Ishtola, yes. Who? Well, it, as as time went on, a lot of a lot of these scions ended up jumping between classes. Yeah, they they really stick to anything, but she's the main one I remember. I tried to think of like healers in Final Fantasy XIV, and Ishtola's face fucking jump scared me. Um, she definitely was doing the white mage thing in her appearance in Dissidia, though. Mm-hmm. Um, Disruptor. Disruptor is... Add it from Elsword. Weird setup moves, being more complex than most characters, and being mean and grinning at you all the time. That's Disruptor. I don't know if it's 2Ds or 1D. But add elsewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and ruiner. Ruiner is mage girl. Starts with an E, maybe. I Something. Although if if we're gonna be invo- if we're going to be invoking El um El Sword, then <clears throat> I am a I am a bit curious mm-hmm. um if as far as far as the mage girl that was um Aisha. But Aisha, bit, yes. But I'm a bit curious as to how as to how you how you might handle um Chung. You know, I was actually big, thinking of that, yeah. With his big ass cannon. The really <laughs> annoying thing is that uh I know they added, like, fourth tiers to all of their classes recently, but from what I remember, there's, like, um, Orbital bomb- Bombardment tune, there's, like, Pistol tune, and there's Cannon tune. They all have the Cannon, but then they get other stuff. And uh, a Berserk form. And a Berserk mode. So, like, depending on what you want, those all have, like, a different weird combination. There, There is, like, a, a Pistolero power in Powerhouse which is all about, like, sort of getting into the mix and doing a bunch of, like, spin-in shots like your Dante and hitting everyone around you, mm-hmm. uh, which could definitely work, especially because it gives you, an uh, like, a sort of ammo management-esque mechanic, which would fit with the mechanics of Tune. But yeah. there's also, like, Long Shot from Ruiner, which lets you charge up big, like, powerful shots with your finishers and go in for, for stuff like that, which would also fit... So it's like, oh, there's a lot of things you could do, it's interesting. And there's, of course, obviously, there's a handful of powers that you have some sort of transformation, uh, which could go with the, 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 the fun little armor mode that he has. I'd probably do something based around like having a lot of push effects with um, some ranged options. I think so the one there's... who would be an absolute pain to try and, to try and adapt... Oh, yeah. Would be Lou and CL. Lou and CL is so funny. I actually wanted to. There is. I actually introduced something super recently. It was in like it was a few patches ago. I don't know if anyone's tried it, but there is a power. This is this was something I really loved about writing Dawn is that every power is an option is an opportunity for me to like fully develop out an idea I like because they'll have their own levels and they're kind of their own system of progression. But yeah, there is a power. Um, that I guess doesn't really fit uh, the flavor of how they work, but that lets you control two characters at once, called Guardian Angel, mm-hmm. which lets you have, like, two bodies. One of them is a caster, and one of them is a, is a physical fighter. Mm-hmm. And uh, the caster gets, like, a, a, a bonus to, like, their charge attacks and their range attacks, and the fighter gets an armor bonus, and they, like, distribute damage between each other. So you can have... CL is the gun guy, right? And Lou is the punch girl. Punch girl? She's punch girl. Um... I forget the names, I might have mixed them up, but Punch Girl could be the, the melee fighter, and then uh, Gun Guy could be the ranged one, and you could actually have like a full setup there, which I think would be fun. Yeah. I suppose another one who might be somewhat tricky to work would be mm-hmm. um, Ein. Ein. He's the, the new, he's like an angel boy, is that yeah. the one? Or, yeah, okay. And his whole I, game I don't game. know his mechanics very well because I haven't played in, like, I haven't played seriously in a few years. I, I hopped on every once in a while. He's but... some, He's something of a switch hitter. Oh, okay. Since it's all, since it's all about building 
um, modes to trans to go into either creation or cycle mode. Oh, okay. Um, I guess I could like you've you played you played FF fourteen, right? I have, yeah. I guess I could liken it to the Astral Fire and Umbral Ice stances in the Black Mage Black kit. Mitch? Yeah. Um, where. Um, cre where creation mo creation mode is far more is far more offensive but far more costly, whereas mm -hmm. psycho mode isn't as powerful but it's um <clears throat> but you're able to you're able to use more use more stuff because it's decreasing mm -hmm. cooldown and MP. Okay, yeah. There mechanically it wouldn't match, but there is like a, a powerhouse power that called equilibrium. Where when you use offensive actions, you get wrath. When you use defensive actions, you get peace, and it gives you um, strengthened or haste, which are effects that you know make you do more damage and make you faster, yeah. uh, as well as some other defensive stuff, which could work out. Though something else that'd be an interesting challenge is is mm -hmm. doing both L Sword and um, Elysis. Yeah, because both both of them could fit the fire so fire swordsman motif. Yeah, but the but the tricky thing is to is and this is something that's a um a measuring stick when it comes to games is can you make two characters in this of the same general archetype and have mm -hmm. them play differently? Yeah, um, I... think of how re. Ryu and Ken started out as palette swaps of each other in terms of their kit, but as the games have gone on, they've gone in different directions. Mm -hmm. Like you're probably familiar with the Ken flow chart. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually looking at that today. I don't remember where I looked at it, but uh -oh. I think I was looking at it in in our messages. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, uh... yeah. The and when I when I look at El Sword and and um. Elessis, they Elessis has seems to ha... seems to um it seems to be far more of an offense type instead of an all rounder like like El Sword is. Yeah, he's got like a bunch of like projectiles and like shielding and stuff, but she just kind of goes in and fucking kills you. <laughs> yeah, which I can I can vibe with. I feel like it it would be like powerhouse and slayer. But they just both pick up the the ruiner power, lets you set yourself on fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like they both share like one high tier power uh, of the flame heart. That's what it's called. Very fitting for them, I feel. And then just like take different uh, other approaches to how they're actually doing the rest of their fight. Yeah. One of them could take like a great sword one and do like big sweep and hits, and one of them could take. Slayer's got like speedster and skirmisher and stuff that mm -hmm. she could take. Yeah, There's a few ways you could do it. And I, I think when speaking of that particular measuring stick, the other thing that yeah. could be that could be a potential challenge is making is doing say the different subtypes of both female and male fighter in DFO. And yeah, making the, and making them um, not oh, um, overlap as as little as possible. Unfortunately, I haven't played much DFO. I know most. I, I was introduced to it through the fighting game, and then I like did some sort of backwards research into the rest of it when it was coming out. I, I remember I went to the like the wiki and I looked at all of the classes and all their levels to like look at. Oh, I wonder if, like what kind of designs they could introduce into this. Um, but yeah, they have. I got a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a game that's been going on for a while, and it seems like there's a lot of yeah, ways you could but pull that. There, there are, there are, so, there are some, um, there are some archetypes that are that are kind of built that you can definitely build around. Um, yes. Nen Master is doing the is doing the more spiritual end of how, of how people see monks. Um, yeah. Striker is t is typically is typically self ex self explanatory um, they strike again. brawler is more is is a strike is striking but is more of a dirty fighter yeah i know um in the fighting game they just released him actually and the brawler has a lot of like 
mines and like t kicking dust in your face to moves, which I think is very funny. Yeah, it does. It doesn't exactly hurt that the the des the design com the, des the design keeps reminding me of Rugal in of Rugal or so or some of the SNK bosses mm -hmm. in King of Fighters. And I'm not saying that because because I'm still triggered every time I see geese. Oh yeah. You've you've probably you've probably played through through at least one SNK game. You should know you should know the pain of dealing with geese. I love uh fucking what is the company? Oh, this this KOF bosses. I forget oh, I SNK. forget who makes SNK bosses. Yes, there it is. Oh, and of course, Grappler is far more of a re is basically a wrestler. Yeah, uh, which I get the feeling that one might be trickier to do in a in a power based system. There is a Grappler power, literally just named Grappler. Uh, um, they have like they're basically just like Giga Taunt. They they can snare more than one person at once, pull them close. They can only. They can only target you as long as you can be targeted, and they have a big like power bomb as their as their final level, which mm -hmm. works and lets you make like a wrestler character. But there aren't a ton of options. You, you basically you take all of those levels and then you you dip into whatever else you think can fit into your theme. <laughs> and. I think the now give now going on with going on with that um given how each given how each each power has has three t has three tiers so is yes. it is it going to be a case where you're going to have to balance between focusing and being a and um being a jack of many trades yeah normally um from what i've seen there's been a lot of playtesting in dawn so i have quite a bit of experience with like what is strong right now and for a lot of character builds i've seen people generally go into one or two powers to full like level three to get like a powerful sort of like payoff move for the, for them and build around that uh because most of the level threes are these very impactful changes to your characters that let you like get like get get something really really powerful off in your kit uh, and the rest of the powers build around that. Because most of the level 1s and level 2s are like, pretty much anyone could use this as so long as you fit a very, like, generous theme. Um, but then once you get to level 3, it's like... A lot of them are like very, these very specific combos you have to pull off that, like, are not going to be super good if you have other combos you're trying to do, or, or whatever. So... Not everyone's going to want to get that third level in all of their powers, even though, you know... None of them have a have an objective downside to taking the third level of the power. Mm-hmm. because uh, I th I could I could see how it could how it could be temp how it could be tempting to hyper focus and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um This is this was also something that I've I've had I've talked about having an issue with when it comes to um the way skill development works in a lot of games. You're mm -hmm. almost disinclined to um. To invest in new skills, because of the because of the fact that it has to play catch up with these skills that are more advanced. Yeah, the skills themselves did actually have that issue for a while, and I had to introduce a cap to them because before it was uncapped, and that was not as fun uh, because everyone was just like, "I'm gonna get this like this pretty malleable skill, and then just put like ten points into it, and just get a ridiculous number of dice on my rolls that can use it." Mm-hmm. Uh, now you're going with a grid. You're going with a grid-based approach. Yes. So, I think what I think one th one thing to d to um delve into is especially with the cinematic combat. Do you do you kind of design grid co your grid combat as it, as if the um PCs are going to be outnumbered like two to one or something? Because um, cinematic combat talks about it being recommended for fights between smaller groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm cu I'm curious if the if um you if the grid combat is meant to be more large scale but between PCs and NPCs. 
There is that option. There are a lot of, like, enemy types and, like, modifiers you can add to be, like, there's a bunch of these little enemies, uh, and they you have to worry a lot about your position, or else you're going to hit by, like, four of them at once, and it's wild. Um, where cinematic combat... The intent of, of that message is less so, like, uh, don't put a swarm against them, and more so, like, if you have, like, one or two players who really want to fight the villain... Don't put them on a board, it's going to be useless, you're just going to be walking at each other anyway. Uh, put them on this very simplified, like, line system. Uh, which I might, I should probably specify somewhere uh, in that section. But yeah, uh, grid combats are, are things that don't use cinematic combat, the standard grid stuff. is supposed to be, like, at least four players, at least four enemies, sometimes more. Mm. Uh... And, you know, because in that situation, you have to worry a lot more about where you are, where the enemies are. But are you going to get hit by more than one person? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And though the, though, I think some, the other thing to note is, is doing an action point thing, which I believe you also did with, Hev with Heaven or Hell. It was on, it was on a point based um, economy. Kind of, yeah. Heaven or Hell had a uh, hope, which was less so action points, but it's. It, it, I guess it was more so matches focus in the current system. But yeah, there is a point based economy for a lot of stuff. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, the the foc the focus attribute the focus um stat is I guess equivalent to MP, but that precludes. You actually use characters actually using magic. Yeah. And well, there's an there's a anime out there's an anime out of some of a <laughs> with it with a protagonist who is just a is just just stupidly strong, but everybody thinks he's a mage. <laughs> I read that recently. It's very good. Yeah, I know what um, you mean. <laughs> Although. I was asked once about what about what sort of isek what sort of isekai idea I'd like to go with. Mm -hmm. Um I had said take take somebody who's a XP of Malcolm Tucker from the thick of it and put him in, put him in charge of cleaning up the mess that a kingdom has made. Oh, yeah. Just let just let him go to town and curse everybody out because if you ever want a, if you ever want a bit of a laugh just just watch clips from that show where he his whole job is is as a press officer for a political party in the UK. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's his job to clean up all the messes that that his par that the party ends up making, and they are all in some form incompetent. Oh yeah. Um. Uh, and every every single one every single one of them, he he finds finds new and interesting ways to be verbally abusive. Um. Mostly, mostly because he has because he, again he's the guy who has to clean up the mess. Mm -hmm. Like if if somebody gets caught in a scandal, he's the one who has to who has to go who has to go out and prepare a presser to try and um, smooth things over. Yeah. But in, but behind the scenes, he's letting them know you are you are a fucking idiot. Don't do that shit again, you fucking idiot. Of course, of course. Um. Uh, so ima imagine somebody like that just just cursing out a king for like three minutes straight. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, but the there there is there is one particular thing that since you're using a grid I do I do have to ask because this was a bit this was a bit of a source of argument back in the day and that is um ha that is handling of diagonal movement I'm guessing yes. it is just just the same as WSAD Purely chessboard movement, yeah. Uh, I considered it, and there was a time where I wanted to steal Icon's idea of letting some characters move diagonally, but it is just... We actually had a thing uh, a few days ago in a playtest where we were talking about how different ranges are drawn. It's definitely It can definitely be a bit messy at times because, like, oh, if you're targeting in a straight line or do diagonal kinds, lines count as one movement, two movement, 1.5, but generally, yeah, yeah all movement is uh, just chessboard. I remember Fantasy Craft, as, as much as I love that game, trying to do a 5-10 rule for, <laughs> for diagonal movement. Nobody cool. I know ever used it. The idea was 
it would it would count as five feet for every other um a pro every other diagonal square yeah that kind of stuff just like never works out in play in my experience especially since when i when i'm trying to visualize it as a as a fight um i don't see any reason why it would be more difficult to move diagonally yeah whether in a whether in a real fight or in an at or in an anime fight, same di- because same. the thing is they always count it as if you're like drawing lines, like triangles or cubes. But you're a human being; you can spin, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? It's like you don't have to fucking. This isn't this isn't a this isn't a wrestling video game where everybody's running the ropes. Yeah. Uh, although if you can't. Although if you can't run the ropes in three strides, then you know, then you're not, then you're doing it completely wrong. Yay. But I, th- with the with that in with that in mind, um, mm-hmm. when it came to when it came to combos, have there have there been instances of people stringing together um, po- powers of the or the like that? Um, we're done. We're done in a way that you that you didn't realize would be OP. When you oh, when every you week, it. I have so many. My playtesters are all nerds. Nerds, what I love. Them. But it, 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 all the time, people are like, "Oh, Joel, did you know that you could jump off of every surface and every surface in existence with this wall jump power and gain an infinite amount of evasion and focus every turn?" No, I did not know that. <laughs> is, is, that why is that why there's the rule of combos can only be performed once per scene? Yeah, uh, combos specifically. I, I've, I've been introducing a lot more limitations. If you know anything about, like, old Yu-Gi-Oh! compared to, like, recent versions, <laughs> oh, God, it, it, don't it's, get me. it's like it's like Yu-Gi-Oh! where every time I release an update, there has, there has to be more hard once per turn additions. This can only be done once per turn. This can only be done once per round. This can be only done once per scene. This can only be done once per turn. Where the old version was all like, just do whatever the fuck you want all the time. <laughs> yeah, because I've... <laughs> I have tr- I tried to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh through Master Duel and some of yeah. the some of the effect chains were absolutely ridiculous. Like I, yeah. I saw an ef- I was in a match once and there was an effect chain that went that went through somebody's whole hand and par- and part of their gra- and part of their graveyard and the series of effects all took about like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and it at is that point insane. almost and at that point, I'm like, you know what? I'm beginning to understand why rush duels were invented when the sevens anime came out. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm also be I had also said, you know, I'm beginning to get a newfound respect for duel masters slash kaijudo. Because mm-hmm. because of, because of the whole five shields thing, it never got that ridic it. Well, it didn't have the opportunity to get that ridiculous because of how long it lasted, but it never really did get that ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, I know some people look at it as Animu Magic the Gathering, which is not true. Force of Will is Animu Magic the Gathering. Oh yeah. I mean, both are, but they're. Do- but I, I have, I have to be um, pedantic. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and. I think so. Now, with I'm guessing, I'm guessing that one of the main things that the Kickstarter is going to be going towards is um, artwork. Yes, it is. Pretty much all of the funding is going towards artwork right now. Mm-hmm. I can make most of my games on a zero dollar budget, but art is a yeah. is a very big exception. Um, and are are you planning on putting in a um an a enemy and and villain um creation system in the full book? Yeah, I've got some light stuff right now, um, and there are some things like, oh, you can combine these enemy types together to make a unique one, or uh, the like little guide of like, here are three types of antagonists and stories that you could use, and there it's a it's a good guideline. But a lot of the um, pretty much everything in the book that's not a rule and is like a you can do this. Here is some advice. Here is some ways to help you. I think needs expanding on. Um, I'm much more of like a technical writer and. Those things don't come as come as fast to me or as uh, as well. So uh, pretty much all of my all of those sections are probably going to be expanded on a little bit uh, by the time the final version is out. 
Yeah, that cer that certainly makes sense. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Release window? Um, so around, like, on Halloween, the day of, the Kickstarter will be done. But I know the money won't be coming in until a bit after that. I don't know exactly when. The Kickstarter is not very good at telling you. But the hard work, the 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 biggest changes and the the biggest jump towards the final release will be around the end of November, I think, where I'll start having more of the art. Um, I want to I want to give a larger window for the artists, of course, because not everyone works at the same pace. Uh, so like maybe like four months after that so february of next year um i would probably have all of the art done and i can never remember how long it took me to do my other games uh but the like refinement and like final little uh like editing bits and making sure all of the numbers work out throughout the whole game it's probably going to take me in those four months I might have all of that done if I'm lucky but you know the game's complicated it might take me a bit longer but sometime before the middle of next year uh, I assume I'll have this all wrapped up I've been working on it for a while so even though like finishing a game in, a foot in like five months is a pretty like wild thing to say for most people mm -hmm. um i don't know i work fast uh i make a very silly amount of games and i've already been working on this for a few years now uh if you maybe a year i'm not sure exactly but i've been working on it for a while and i think that once the art starts rolling in after the kicks is finished and i have money to pay artists um i'll be able to get this done pretty quick mm -hmm. oh it's not like I'm one to talk when it comes to working on a project for several years. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that ha that happens around here. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you have you in the temple whether it be for one of the projects or one of my crazy experiments. And Discord decided to derp on me again. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Discord decided no to cut my mic. Um, I was just, I, I was just going through the thank the usual thanks. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Of as course, I often thank say, you. as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Of course, of course. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!